Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Stimulating Conversations, the first of two events dedicated to educating movement disorder patients and caregivers about deep brain stimulation, which we're going to refer to in shorthand as DBS. My name is Alexa Georgie. I'm the Public Affairs Advisor for Toronto Western Hospital, and I'll be moderating uh, this event. Tonight's program is for patients who are considering DBS treatment and consists of a presentation by the clinical team, a patient and caregiver perspective presentation, followed by a Q&A of questions that were both submitted in advance and um, we'll be taking some live questions as well. So I'd like to now introduce a few members of the University Health Network's Movement Disorders Program clinical team who are here to present and answer questions. Dr. Alfonso Fazano, neurologist. Dr. Sunil Kalia, neurosurgeon. Dr. Marta Statuka, neuropsychologist. And Dr. Matthias Zorowski, psychiatrist. Uh, before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to share some housekeeping notes. So we're meeting on a Zoom webinar platform. There are two ways for audience members to interact. Uh, there's a chat and a Q&A option, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. So we ask that if you're just making casual comments, if you could please use the chat function while the questions should be submitted under the Q&A button. Um, this session is being recorded. So if you'd prefer to ask a question anonymously, make sure to check the Ask Anonymous Question checkbox when submitting your question. And if at any time you have any technical issues, please ask those questions in the chat and one of our technicians will assist you directly. So we'll now get things underway with a presentation led by Dr. Fizzano. Over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you to the Patient Advisory Board and uh, our sponsor, Abbott, for tonight. Uh, I just want to say a few words about deep brain stimulation so that uh, we set the stage and uh, we know what we're talking about. Deep brain stimulation is a brain pacemaker, as you can see from this uh, animation. And it's currently used in many countries, including Canada, for a number of indications that you see there listed. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk mainly about movement disorders, uh, particularly Parkinson's disease, but this is also approved for tremor, essential tremor in particular, and dystonia. It's also used in other conditions like scl um, multiple sclerosis related tremor, um, but it's not approved for those conditions. And then there is also a number of experimental indications uh, that you see there listed. Uh, in terms of um, the assessment, which ones are the good patients, uh, the candidates for this therapy. We have a number of inclusion criteria that we keep in mind. The diagnosis should be clear, the disease duration should be long enough, and that sometimes is needed to have a clear neurological diagnosis. And more importantly, the quality of life and the social functioning needs to be influenced uh, by signs that are known to be responsive to medications, and in particular, deep brain stimulation. And last but not least, all the less invasive options, uh, medications, botulinum toxin in the case of dystonia, have been attempted and they are uh, not uh, effective. In, for Parkinson's disease, uh, we also want to see motor fluctuations and or dyskinesias. And usually there is a cutoff um, of 70 years of age or 75, depending on the target. Instead, no real cutoff um, exists for the other indications like dystonia and essential tremor. There are also exclusion criteria, particularly uh, if the patient is suffering from major limitation, uh, major limiting uh, uh, systemic conditions that are affecting the quality of life, severe depression, severe cognitive problems or psychosis, and supporting criteria like patient's motivation, lack of excessive expectations, a supportive uh, caregiver or family. And for Parkinson's disease, we also want to uh, see a very good response to levodopa. But that's not important when it comes to tremor, because even when tremor doesn't respond to levodopa, we know it will respond to deep brain stimulation. The step two in our process is selecting the target. Uh, deep brain stimulation is just the technique, but we can place the, elect the electrodes in different locations. In the thalamus, uh, we place electrodes when we want to treat tremor, Parkinson's causing tremor or essential tremor or other tremors. 
Um, in the subthalamus, uh, we place the electrodes for Parkinson's patients, and this treats tremor, rigidity, slowness, fluctuations, dystonia maybe, uh, depending on the patient, um, and dyskinesias. The effect of dyskinesias is indirect. Uh, uh, this is because uh, we can lower medications after surgery by about 50% on average, and this is why dyskinesias improve. The final target that we consider is globus pallidus, uh, which is used for dystonia, but also for Parkinson's uh, patients. Uh, it's perhaps a little less effective than subthalamic stimulation, but seems to be safer. And more importantly, is very effective for treating dyskinesias. So after globus pallidus DBS, patients don't reduce medications because this stimulation is perhaps less effective, but the stimulation itself will take care of the dyskinesias. The, Crucial question is when to do this type of uh, intervention. And this is a way, the way I explain it. There is a motor condition that unfortunately progresses with disease um, progression, but there is an adaptation phase during which the patient does well uh, because of medications, because of some changes in their life, like working from home, going out less often, seeing friends at home, for instance. Uh, but there is a certain point where there is a and a further decline. And if we do surgery at this point, we will improve the patient motor condition, but not necessarily the psychosocial condition of the patient. For instance, if meanwhile the patient had lost their job, it will be difficult to go back to working again, even if you're finally moving better in the case of Parkinson's. So this is why the job of the neurologist is to keep track of the adaptation, if anything. And when the adaptation is about to be lost, this is when surgery should be considered. Uh, this is my last slide, uh, just to describe more or less what's a DBS flow. Uh, there is a referral, uh, for instance, to our uh, center coming from neurologist, uh, but you can even ask your own neurologist and they can uh, uh, tell you why uh, you are a possible candidate or why you are not. Um, and then you get into our three steps assessment that I just explained. And finally, there is surgery. You meet the neurosurgeon before, of course. Uh, we discuss your case uh, uh, in our uh, monthly meetings and then surgery happens. Usually the stay in hospital is pretty short, um, three days usually, a little longer sometimes. And then a month and a half, two months later, we do the programming. The programming takes place in about three to six months. So it may take time for the stimulation to be optimized. Uh, and then at this point, then you followed by, by us or by other neurologists with expertise in this field. And you might need to have a battery replacement every three to five years, depending on the battery consumption. In some cases, you might have a rechargeable system, a rechargeable battery. And in this case, the, the, the battery replacement can take place uh, uh, at longer intervals. Uh, and with this, I thank you all for your attention and over to the next uh, speaker. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Fasano. Um, I'd now like to turn things over to um, Darlene, who is going to give us a perspective um, as a caregiver for somebody who received DBS treatment. <clears throat> Excuse me, over to you, Darlene. Thank you, Alexa. So good evening, my name is Darlene and I've been a caregiver for approximately 30 years. We started the process when my husband was about 27 and it took a couple years and a couple neurologists to come back and confirm young onset Parkinson's. It was about eight years later that he was referred to the movement disorder clinic. The testing uh, to see if he was a candidate took about two years and he was. The final test, it gave us hope. He had the surgery about a month prior to his 40th birthday and it was successful. He went from being in a wheelchair to walking with a Rolaid walker to eventually a cane. He went from maximum meds, reducing down to eventually none. I know everyone is different, but it reset his meds and he could walk. There were bumps in the road, detours, like issues with the programming and the rechargeable battery, but we worked through them. It's now routine for him to recharge his battery here at home every few days. We're approaching 17 years this February since his surgery. He's had five battery changes. Four were regular, one rechargeable. The rechargeable was November, 2019. So what did the surgery mean to my husband? It released his rigidity and his pain. It reset his meds 
and gave him the ability to walk again. But again, everyone is different. What did the surgery mean to us? It gave us hope and it gave us some control back. So in short, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share our story and for the Movement Disorder Clinic for putting this together because I think it's really gonna make a difference in helping you make a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene, for sharing your perspective with us. Um, I'm now going to introduce Gordon Myers, um, one of the event organizers, who's also going to give us his perspective as somebody who's considering DBS treatment. Uh, thank you, Darlene. Um, I'm uh, the chair of the event, this event, and a member of the Movement Disorder Clinic's Patient Advisory Board at uh, Toronto Western. Our board's mission is to advise on innovations in clinical care, education, research, and business activities with the intent of improving patient experience, communication, and the quality of research conducted within the Movement Disorders Program at the University Health Network based here in Toronto. Um, I'm a 64-year-old man, 11 years into a Parkinson's uh, disease diagnosis, who is, uh, I, I'm, I'm pondering, uh, the next step and the possibility of, of DBS. It's exciting, but it's also pretty scary. So how hard can it be? It's, uh, it's not like it's brain surgery. Well, it, it, it's brain surgery. And uh, you'll see some pictures a little later, but at, at any rate, um, yeah, hopefully the knowledge that uh, you and I can gain as, as people looking into DBS uh, will help us make the, make, the, make the right decision for us. It's not right for everybody, but well, we've got to get informed. Uh, this evening, we are trying to focus on the often asked, but, barely, but rarely, <laughs> rarely answered questions about DBS. After this event, we will send out information about, uh, about and links to some reputable and thorough sources of DBS info. So what you don't learn here, you'll take, you'll take with you one way or another. So without further ado, um, uh, back to uh, back to Alexa, and enjoy the program. Thank you, Gordon. Um, so we're now going to start our Q and A uh, answer session. Um, as a reminder, just please put any questions that have come to mind in the Q and A window, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you want to ask your question anonymously, just make sure that you check the ask anonymously box before you submit the question. Um, just to note that when we first moved to the questions, there were some questions that were submitted in advance of the session, uh, which were reviewed by uh, the panel. So we're going to answer those questions first before going to the live questions. Um, a lot of the questions were grouped by theme and we eliminated any repetitive questions. So just in case you don't hear yours asked specifically. Um, and we're gonna take the same approach for the live questions. Um, we are going to open the Q&A with one more patient perspective from uh, Ben Stetcher. So over to you, Ben, and then we'll start taking questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alexa. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna be giving a quick, um, uh, let's see if this works, yes. A quick presentation here about some of the things that I've been through as a result of DBS. Am I, you know, it's been both a good thing and a bad thing for me in particular. Just get this thing out of the way and let's see if this will work. All right. So I developed what I think are what I what I would call the three pillars of deep brain stimulation surgery. These are the three things that I think you need if you're going to be considering going through this and if you are going to actually go through it in the end. And yeah, my name is Benjamin Stetcher. So just so you know, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's about eight years ago now, almost exactly eight years ago almost. Um, and I've since been on a pretty wild journey. I've gone around the world trying to figure out this disease for myself and trying to understand as best as I possibly can. However, there's only so much that one person can do. So I've relied on a bunch of different sources. And this is one man who I think um, really embodies some of the things that I'm trying to talk about here. His name is Li Wenliang, and he's the guy actually, he was the original whistleblower on uh, the coronavirus as well. I'm not gonna speak too much about him because uh, it's kind of off topic at the moment, but I do wanna jump ahead to two other things. So there's this point as well, I'm not gonna touch too much on that though. If anybody has any questions, we can come back to this part a little bit later about why I chose DBS of all the other options that might've been available to me. But like I said, I'm gonna focus on those three pillars that I talked about before. And here are those three pillars for me. 
anyways, or what I think the three things that you need if you're going to consider actually going through this procedure for yourself. The first thing is you need a very, very good surgeon. You need somebody who obviously knows exactly what they're doing. They have a lot of experience. And more importantly, I think they should be not afraid to answer some of the tough questions that you might have for them. And in my opinion, you should be ready to ask whatever you want when you go into that, when you meet with your surgeon. And they should have the confidence to be able to answer it. And they should be also talking about some of the mistakes that they've made in the past. And this is a question that I'd love for people to start filling up their chat box with as well. What kinds of things do you think might go wrong during a DBS surgery? Or what are the things that they have experienced might go wrong during DBS? There's a ton of things that could happen during the surgery. Um, and I think, I think uh, patients often have this kind of inflated idea of the surgery itself not because it's not traumatic. I mean, it's a very traumatic thing and it's a very horrible thing that a lot of people will have to go through at some point if you actually wanna go through the, with the surgery itself. But actually for me in particular, it wasn't the worst day of this whole procedure. And I can talk about some of those other days if you want, but I would say don't spend too much time if you're gonna go through this, worrying about what's gonna to happen to you on that one specific day, because so much of it is out of your control and it's out of your hands to begin with. However, you are probably, and if you're gonna do it here in Toronto, I'd advise you to try and be awake for the entire thing. Now, if you have to be asleep, you can be put asleep. If you get very, very anxious right before, I mean, there's all sorts of things that we could do to help you have a better journey through this whole procedure. But I think it is important that you try and be awake for the whole thing because, I mean, for one in particular, for one thing, it'll help your surgeon actually get that thing to the right spot. And the day of the surgery, that's all you really care about, to be honest, is making sure that he does, has everything that he needs or she to get that probe into the right spot. If they can do that and if they can sew it all up and if there's no infections afterwards, then their job is effectively done until you need your battery replaced at some point. But essentially you won't have to see them for three or four years. So that's why I'd kind of recommend that if, if you have, if you are able and if you can summon it. However, like I said, it's a very, very tough day. And it's a very difficult thing to go through. So this is how my day began with this lovely little frame getting bolted onto my skull to make you look a, bit, a little bit like a Batman villain. Um, however, the day after the actual battery replacement, so after the battery was replaced into my chest and the wires were tunneled through my neck, that day was much, much worse. Uh, it's much worse for a bunch of reasons, but as Dr. Kali, I think, once told me, so this surgery through your skull is actually a very precise procedure, and they've really refined it, and they've really done a great job of making sure that they, you know, use as much care and precision as possible. But this one, where they tunnel the wires through your neck, and around your head and over your ear, and down to the battery that's then implanted into your chest. Um, not that it's not as refined, but it doesn't matter quite as much. I mean, it matters, but it's something where there's not as much procedures that they have to go through because they're simply trying to like make sure that they connect the two things together, essentially. Now, while there's a lot of difficulty in doing that, sometimes some things can go wrong. And for a lot of patients, actually, the after effects from that second procedure where they're actually putting the battery and the wiring their thing up, the after effects from that are much, much worse often than the after effects from the surgery. Now the surgery itself is gonna look pretty gruesome at the end, but you'll feel this much more than you'll ever feel anything that's going on up in your head. But anyway, the next, all oh, right, right, sorry, before we get to that next part, um, I just wanna do a quick warning that these next pictures are very, very graphic. So if you don't wanna see them, you can turn away for the moment and I'll tell you when to turn back. But I think it's important that some people, that you're aware of the, reality of what you're about to face. This is not an easy thing to go through and this is a very difficult day that you'll have if you are gonna actually choose to go through this procedure itself. And here are the pictures from my own surgery. Um, and you'll see I was awake for the entire thing. So my eyes somewhat open there. And even that picture on the right, it's difficult even for me to look at that thing because I can, I can kind of still feel that whole procedure on that day. And if I really focus, I can kind of like close my eyes and like think about that whole experience that I went through but it's, it's not an easy thing by any means. And you have to be able to stomach it and you have to be ready for that as well. Um, but like I said, this wasn't even the most difficult day of this whole procedure. And it came with one little kind of weird bonus as well, which is I got to hear the sound of my own subthalamic nucleus. And I forgot to turn on that button that I was supposed to turn on at the beginning, but it's okay. Really, it just sounds like a Geiger counter. So I don't think you'll even be able to hear this even if I try to play, but let's see what happens. And anyway, can somebody can alert me if they don't hear anything. But if you can't hear it, it's basically just a sound of like a Geiger counter that's going off. But what it really is, is thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of your own neurons that are all excitedly firing all at once. Um, and there's all sorts of cool things that I could say about that, but we don't have time for that right now. 
the second pillar that I want to talk about is your neurologist. Now, I've known Dr. Vizzano for quite a while now. I think he's been my neurologist for almost six years. But the important part is that you develop a good relationship with your neurologist and your programmer what, long before the surgery, if you can. If you have access to somebody who can actually, who you know is going to might be your programmer one day, try to strike a relationship with them as quickly as you possibly can, because they're going to be at some point, they're going to have literal control over your brain and your mood and your behavior and so many different things because they come along with DBS. Um, I'll speak, if you, anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to talk about those as well. But it is very important that at some point you establish that you find the right person for you in particular, because everybody needs, I think, somebody a little bit different as well. And I think more importantly, you find somebody that you can trust implicitly as well. Because you're going to have to know this person very well, and they have to know, more importantly, know who you are very well as well. And just something quickly about UFT in general is that I feel very grateful and very lucky to be where and when I am today. Um, I know like very vividly that if I'd been alive at almost, sorry, any other time and place, I probably would not have been able to do this for sure today. And I guess more importantly, I wouldn't have been able to walk, I wouldn't have been able to write. And for me, I wouldn't have been able to type, which is one thing that I think DBS has really given me. Now, the third pillar and the final thing that I want to really, really blabber about here is family. After the surgery, you really need a very good home environment that you can come to, and you need people that are willing to do whatever you might need at that on that day when you come back and for the weeks afterwards. These, this is my mom right here in the middle, my uncle and my dad. These three people have really helped me get through this, not only from a physical perspective. I mean, there's a lot of things that I couldn't do. And there was days afterwards where I felt really sick or very terrible in other ways. And they put up with a lot of other crap along the way that I had to uh, kind of go through. But they also all helped me mentally as well, just get through this and make sure that I, you know, had my head on straight as I was going, or as straight as it could be, I guess, for me going through it. Um, so yeah, those are the three pillars of DBS. And with that, I think I'll hand it over to the next person to talk about, uh, oh, I guess this one last thing is important. So this is what I feel like is the biggest benefit that I've had so far from DBS. So I think some of you who have Parkinson's might be familiar with these kinds of curves or you've seen this before, but the big curve that you'll see is kind of the day that I experienced before. That big sine wave, that's what I felt before the surgery because every day was on, off, on, off, on, off. And I had very little time in the middle where I could actually do things. However, what DBS has done is it's flattened that curve and made it almost flat. I mean, it's not entirely flat, but that's the biggest benefit that I feel right now. And that's why I'd say it was worth it in the end for me in particular, but, Anybody who's considering it has to think very carefully and you have to get yourself to a point where you feel like you can understand it well enough, at least to explain it to somebody else. And that's the number one rule that I would say about DBS in particular. Well, aside from those three pillars, once you have those in place, make sure you get yourself to a point where you're comfortable explaining it to somebody else. Hopefully the next patient that might be behind you in the process or maybe a family member or a loved one or somebody to that degree, because you have to have some understanding of what you're about to go through. One, if you're gonna sign the informed consent to begin with, and then two, more importantly, if you're going to be comfortable enough going through this whole thing for yourself. And with that, I'll stop talking and hand it back over to Alexa now for the rest of the show. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Ben, for that presentation. Uh, so now we're now going to start with uh, the Q&A, as I mentioned uh, before. And just so you're aware, um, following the events, an email will be sent out to all of the registrants with the recording to this session, um, as well as answers to questions um, and some of the ones that we might not be able to get to. So uh, just be on the lookout for that after the event. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to start with the questions that were submitted by registrants prior to uh, the session, and some of them have been grouped and we eliminated repetitive questions. And our clinical panel are going to um, take turns, I think, uh, answering those questions for you. So the first one, who is DBS best for and what personality types do well with DBS and what types do not? Maybe I can just start saying um, by saying that um, uh, in Parkinson's, we look at uh, levodopa responsiveness. Uh, in other conditions like tremor and dystonia, we just make sure that the disorder is affecting the functioning and enough medications uh, uh, was treated, uh, was tried. Uh, but I think the most important part of this question is about the personality. Uh, and I think uh, we have uh, a neuropsychologist and a psychiatrist here with us. And I wanna um, hand the question over to them because I think uh, they have uh, an important job in selecting patients for us. They evaluate even personality uh, before surgery and expectations, for instance. So maybe Matthias, you want to start? 
Sure, I'm, um, I'm, Dr. I'm Matthias Zorowski, I'm a psychiatrist at the Western. Um, you know, in selecting patients for this surgery, it's not so much personality. I mean, there's other things that we look for, as Dr. Fasano's slides indicated, there's more depression, psychosis. But one of the things I think I want to repeat also what uh, Ben has said is that the relationship with the neurologist after the surgery is going to be very key. And um, with surgery, you are letting go a little bit of control of your medications. As much as it's painful to have the ups and downs of medications, with surgery, with deep brain stimulation, Dr. Fasano or another neurologist is going to be helping and programming the device. The control is to some extent out of your hands. So that is something that's a bit of an adjustment for some people. But it's not necessarily to say that there is a personality type that uh, is best suited or unsuited for this surgery. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so the next question is under the same theme. Uh, do I have to have a care partner at home to have DBS treatment? And if so, why? Um, and is this consistent everywhere in Canada as a requirement? Well, again, um, I can start. Um, we always evaluate the caregivers, the family, uh, because uh, as you heard before from, from Ben, uh, sometimes stimulation can cause uh, slight personality changes. Uh, so sometimes people may, may, uh, may develop mania. It's very rare, but it can happen. If, and if, if the patient lives alone, it's difficult for us to really appreciate uh, what happens in real life. Uh, on the other hand, especially when we lower medications and, and we do that too fast, uh, patients might develop uh, depression, apathy, um, in the past, there have been uh, cases of suicide. We don't see suicide anymore because we learn that we need to reduce the medication slowly, we need to monitor, and that's now much better. Uh, but again, with the family around, we are told if something is different, if uh, the, the person is not the usual uh, person that they happen to know for, for, for their, their entire life. And obviously, a family member knows this kind of things, a little changes way better than us. Um, probably Ben has more to add in this case, uh, but what, what do we do in cases where there's no family member? Uh, there's always a friend, there's always someone else that can come with the patient and at least uh, be around and check even with a phone call once a week. We, we don't necessarily want to have someone 24 seven with the patient, but we wanna make sure that there's someone in their environment, someone in their surroundings that can keep an eye on them and let us know if things don't do the way we predicted. Um, in some cases, we have seen also family members that maybe were living far and they moved uh, with the person that underwent surgery for, for a couple of months just to make sure that everything was fine and then they moved back. Uh, so there are creative ways to, to overcome this issue, but it's important to have someone around for sure. Thank you. Um... And so what other supports are in place for patients interested in DBS, such as pre and post surgery psychological support? Yeah, again, yeah, Marta, you want to say, yeah, please. Yes, I was just gonna say that we don't um, follow up people uh, in neuropsychology from a psychological perspective, but we do follow people up in order to assess their thinking abilities. Um, after surgery. So we see everybody before surgery for a preoperative assessment, uh, just as Dr. Fasano said, uh, part of those three assessments preoperatively. And then we also follow up people one year after surgery and five years after surgery as part of standard care. Um, if at some point um, somebody is concerned about their thinking abilities beyond the five years or even before the one year, um, then they can always be referred to our clinic and we will reassess them to see how they're doing from a thinking perspective to see if we can make any uh, community recommendations or uh, kind of tricks that you can do in your day-to-day -day life to help uh, your thinking abilities work to the best of their possibilities. Um, and uh, um, that's kind of what our standard of care is in our clinic. Again, looking at your thinking abilities, not necessarily your um, psychological well -being. I just want to add that sometimes people need support, uh, psychological support, and unfortunately we don't provide them uh, with what they need. We tried in the past, 
uh, in an era when we didn't have any you know, virtual meeting like we're having tonight. Uh, so this is the first event and we're gonna have another one coming up soon in December. But the idea is that to start this tradition uh, through which people can share their experience, uh, uh, hear from others and uh, understand that they are not alone. And this is part of our attempt to, to help them also from, from a psychological standpoint. I think this is very important. And we always realized that this was needed. And maybe if anything, one of the advantages of the pandemic is that it, it taught us how important it is to be connected even with virtual platforms. And maybe that's the way to, to, do, it, to do it moving forward. You know, there is also, if I may add, there's a couple of things. Often what we do is the assessment is actually quite a few months ahead of time of surgery. That's what it has been before COVID. And that allows for us to, for me, if I, I'm part of the assessment team to follow up with individuals and see if I can help create sort of uh, an understanding of what the surgical process is about for those that uh, I am particularly concerned about. There's also education like we're providing today, but also through brochures. There's also the follow-up afterwards because you're gonna be seeing Dr. Fasano or another neurologist actually quite a few times in those two months of programming. So actually we try and keep pretty close track of people who uh, we feel would be uh, that we're concerned about, but of course, we're also very much relying on the individual and their care partners, families to, uh, to let us know if there is something happening that we need to attend to. Over to you, Alexa. Oh, thank you. Um, so the next question I think is two parts. So I'm just gonna ask them separately because they're, they're a little unrelated. Um, so the first part is uh, how long does the whole process take? So I'm assuming from assessment to the point of um, seeing some results from the treatment. Well, I can I can take that. Um, so so we work as a team. I think we want to also get that across to everybody. And um, uh, we have a great team in place at the Kremble. And so the journey for for the patient, as uh, Dr. Fasano showed on the slide, has multiple stops along the way. So the analogy I use with with our patients is is at each stop, it's it's like green light, yellow light, red light. This this is a quality of life intervention. So the bar is is very high um, uh, for us to deliver this safely. So at each stop, we're determining um, if DBS is a right match for for a patient um, uh, with Parkinson's or other movement disorders, and um, we need to have the risk as low as possible and the benefit as high as possible. And as a team, we need to match the benefit with the patient's expectations and the family's expectations. Um, with COVID, the timelines have, have now become a little bit complex, but as a team, our goal was to get someone from the first referral to uh, the assessment for surgery, uh, through surgery and programming within a span of 12 months. Um, the wait times, fluctuate and COVID has slowed things down a little bit, uh, but pre-COVID that, that was the window that our team was trying to, uh, to work in. And if we established a, a green lights across the board, that was the 12, 12 months. If there are yellow lights, then maybe you would have to spend um, more um, uh, meetings with Dr. Zarowski, for example, or the team would wait and see, maybe we'd wait and see long, um, uh, as, um, more time went by to see if this was the right surgery. If there was a, a red light, it, it just means that this one treatment is, is not uh, a good fit and, and we'd explain why. Uh, and generally it's either the benefit uh, to, the, to the risk ratio is, is not great or there's something else that makes uh, this a risky option or, or um, uh, the benefit doesn't line up with the expectations for what uh, the patient or the family have. So that's the journey. And, and our goal is always within 12 months, uh, if possible. And hopefully as COVID, we're in the tail end now, uh, we can get back uh, to that timeline. Of course, we're working to be um, even more efficient. Uh, someday, I hope we can do all of this within four to six months. Um, uh, but our goal is within, within 12 months.
Okay, thank you. Um, so the second part of the question, um, is there a risk of if I don't start the ball rolling now, I'm going to miss my window or not hit my optimum time? I can speak to that uh, briefly, uh, saying that um, this is an intervention uh, able to treat symptoms. Uh, it's a symptomatic therapy. It's not a cure. Um, and therefore, uh, when the time comes, uh, when the famous adaptation I was telling you about before is lost or about to be uh, lost, uh, then it's when you need to do surgery. Um, there's no reason in doing it earlier. Uh, it will not change your future. Uh, it doesn't make sense to, to do it too late because it might be riskier. It might be uh, after many years that you uh, had a poor quality of life because of the, the symptoms that weren't uh, treated uh, the best possible way. So there is a, a window um, but there's no need to be anxious uh, of having this fear of missing out that uh, at some point uh, uh, it's too late and you, you lost the benefit. But it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, clearly, you need to be in touch uh, with a neurologist that will monitor your progression, speak about uh, your problems, um, and, and discuss when it's time to be referred. There is a sweet spot as well. As Dr. Fasano has suggested, it's if you do it too early, you risk, right? Surgery is a risk. So, and what you want to do is find the time, like our job, what we try and do is make sure that this is a procedure that will help your movement. But then on your part, you have to come to the conclusion that this is the time that you want to take the risk because the symptoms are bothersome enough for you to warrant the risk that you're going to take. So, because if you do this too early, what you try, you're, you're risking actually not being happy with the outcome because there's risk here. Something may happen or mm, you're letting control, letting go of this control of managing your own medications and somebody else is controlling your symptoms and you may feel that you are actually managing them reasonably well by yourself prior to surgery. So there is a sweet spot. And what we try and do is say, okay, we can help you with these kinds of things, but then you have to decide, okay, are these the kinds of things that are bothering me the most at the present time so that I go ahead with the procedure? And I just wanted to add a little bit about and add on to what Ben had said earlier that people kind of come to the process at different stages. Uh, some people will be in my assessment and ask, are there any cancellations for tomorrow? I'm ready to go, let's do this. Uh, and other people, um, are sort of feeling out the waters and just testing, are they even a candidate? Um, and sometimes people decide that that time is not a good time and they might come five years later, 10 years later, I've, I've recently seen somebody um, who decided that the first time around that it was not the right time for them. And then they decided later as their disease progressed that now they're, they would want to consider the surgery. Um, so it's important to come to events like this and learn a little bit more about it and see, is this something that, you know, is, is important for you that you want to learn more about? Do you think you're a good candidate? And again, sometimes that changes for people. People feel out the waters and decide it's not the right time and maybe later is, and maybe it's not. It's not for everybody, as, uh, as Gordon has mentioned before as well. And, and going back to my uh, green light, yellow light, red light analogy, uh, of course, someone who's undergoing or thinking about undergoing the procedure, you're on the team, your family's on the team, so you can hear everything we have to say, and you can put a yellow light or a red light at the end of it. Um, I think as you're picking a team to work with, this, this is definitely not, because it's a quality of life intervention, this is not an operation anybody should be telling you you have to have. It's a very personal decision. Our job as a team is, is to identify if you're in the sweet spot and, and, um, and, and make sure it's safe and that we can deliver on, um, uh, on, on the potential for benefit. But this should not be a, a scenario where, where someone is telling you that you have to have this operation or, or someone else that's had it is telling you you should have it. It's a very personal decision. Uh, and, and, um, uh, and you have to, uh, as Ben said, learn as much as, as much as you want or as little as you want. That's also a personal decision about, about the procedure. But I think the key is understanding what is a realistic goal and um, and and is it a is it a right time to pursue it now or wait? Um, uh, and our job is always to, uh, if you choose to wait, uh, to reassess if more than a year has gone by. Is it still safe? Is it still can we still deliver the benefits that we had discussed um, a year ago or five years ago?
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so moving on, we're gonna look at good and bad outcomes. How do you measure whether a DBS procedure has been a success? Do patients use different measures than clinicians to measure success? Yeah, they do. And uh, the biggest mistake in medicine was uh, in the past that we were only measuring uh, the scores of the disease without paying attention to the happiness of the patient or the family. In other words, the, the focus wasn't the quality of life or the functioning, but it was simply uh, motor score, for instance, or a much tremor. Uh, we are now trying to um, uh, think uh, the same way. And we, yes, we still use this uh, doctor scales that we need to just to keep track of uh, what we're doing and if we're doing the right thing uh, from a scientific standpoint. But more importantly, we, we, we see what's the satisfaction level. And, and I think that the easiest way to assess success is simply asking the patient, would you do it again? Because obviously there are pros and cons. As you heard already, there are many things that don't do well. It's not a everything is fine or everything is bad. There, there are little successes and there are uh, little problems. Uh, and at the end of the day, the, the question is, would you do it again? And I would say 99% of the time patients say yes. Um, so obviously that's, uh, I would say pretty good, especially when there's a good selection. Uh, but clearly there is a proportion of patients that are disappointed. Um, uh, they, they were expecting more or they're completely uh, disappointed to the point that they wish they never met us. Uh, this is obviously not common, but it can happen. And our job is certainly increase education, trying to explain the, uh, the good and the bad of deep brain stimulation so that the expectations are set uh, beforehand, but also to understand uh, from our mistakes and um, medicine is making progresses at any level and also deep brain stimulation. It's been around for over 30 years. It's not experimental. It's really an established therapy. And uh, over the years, we, we learned how to make it better. Certainly, we're far from being perfect, uh, but at least we're seeing improvements. Great. Uh, next question. Um, so can DBS, uh, so sorry, in addition to restoring movement, can D DBS reduce the amount of medications and thus the side effects and risks of some of them? How, um, let's start with that because this actually has uh, three questions in it. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. So in addition to affecting movement from uh, Parkinson's, can DBS reduce the amount of medications that a patient needs and thus the, the side effects and risks of those medications? Yes, depending on the target. Uh, for Parkinson's, if we do subthalamic DBS, yes. Um, in some cases, also with the other targets. Uh, but the goal is not to lower medications. The goal is to improve their life and uh, whatever it takes. Sometimes it's medication and DBS. Sometimes it's only DBS. It rarely happens, but it can happen. Uh, but in general, yes, we're able to simplify the regimen. You know, what you have is a surgery that addresses movement. Ideally, it's purely movement. The medications vary. The medications and Parkinson's disease as a whole is more than just movement quite often by the time you come to surgery. So there may be depression, there may be anxiety, there may be sleep difficulties, pain, constipation. There are a lot of different difficulties that individuals may have. Surgery affects movement. Medications can actually help with mood, for instance. So we have to be very careful how we change those medications. So there is a whole bunch of balancing that has to occur with the programming and possible changes of medications that we are assessing and following, assessing prior to the procedure and following after the procedure, because these are gonna determine your quality of life afterward. Great, okay, and then the second part of that question, um, how long do the benefits of DBS last? Is it five? years, 10 years, indefinitely, and what happens once um, it stops working? Yeah, that's a very good question. It's a common question, um, and there is not a single answer because DBS is not a therapy for the disease. It's a therapy for a number of symptoms. So if we're talking about tremor, rigidity, slowness, um, dyskinesias, fluctuations, uh, then the answer is that it's gonna last forever. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't stop the disease progression. So, and obviously, I'm talking about Parkinson's now. 
So if because of Parkinson's progression, there is balance problem, uh, cognitive problems like memory disorders or hallucinations, DBS is not gonna help. And, and what's left is what is not treated. And it looks like DBS has stopped working, but we now know that if you turn it off, for instance, things are much worse. Uh, so it, it will work for many years, ideally forever for specific problems, uh, but it won't treat everything. Put it, putting it another way is is a, is at different phases. Uh, how how do those problems that DBS helps with impact your quality of life? Uh, so as Dr. Fasano says, in those specific things that DBS helps, it it will work 15, 20 years. As doctors, we can measure device on versus device off. But if some of the other things in Parkinson's are now impacting your quality of life that the DBS doesn't help. By that measure, um, you, you can say the intervention is no longer improving your quality of life. Uh, it's neutral uh, to, to the quality of life. So, so that's another way of looking at it. This is a quality of life intervention. Um, and, um, and, and that's how, how, how uh, it can be measured as well. Okay, thank you. Um... So the next question, are patients realistic in their expectations, both good and bad, and versus uh, doing nothing? So I think meaning do they have a full understanding of uh, the treatment and what to expect? Uh, I would say absolutely not. Even I think I was pretty well educated going in and I did not know enough about this whole process. Again, like I said, I thought the day of the surgery would be the worst part. Well, the day of the surgery was very brutal to get through. It was not the worst thing that I've experienced since. Um, so don't place too much emphasis on that one day. And yeah, don't expect to know everything either because I guarantee you no, nobody can know everything at this point. Uh, I've, I've toured the world. I've tried, to, I've tried to educate myself as best I possibly can. And even I did not feel adequately prepared for everything that I've experienced since. Um, the other thing, but I actually would have a question for everybody as well, for the other panelists if you don't mind about the process itself and which parts of it do you think that you should, you could or could be improved going forward? Because if I'm being frank, I would say that if we're still doing the same thing and we're still getting the same outcomes today as we are next year, the year after the year after, then we're not really doing our jobs properly. I mean, we should all be trying to improve every year. We, get, we should be getting a little bit better and better and better at this. But there's one other point that I wanna make about UFT in general and that is that I had a choice of like other places that I could have gone to if I really wanted to, but I still chose UFT and this great team here because of the, well, for there's a lot of reasons, but um, Canada is a great place to have this kind of surgery done for one. And two, the team around you that we have here is really one of the best in the world. And I can say that very confidently because I've been all around the world and I've met all, well, not all, but many of the best teams that we have on this planet. And there's, there's, no, other, there's no other place that I'd rather go than here to get it done. But there's still things that can be improved even in a place like this. So I guess I'd just be curious to know from each of you, which part of your own process or the process in general do you think should be or could be improved? as we continue to try to improve this technique going forward. Um, yeah, thanks for the comment, Ben. Uh, I'll start as usual, uh, try to be uh, quick because I know there are many other questions that we need to answer. Uh, for sure, there is room for improvement at any stage and any step of the process that I mentioned. Uh, if I can pick one or two, maybe the first one is patient selection. Clearly, there are uh, aspects of the disease or the diseases we treat that we don't understand. They are very heterogeneous. Parkinson's disease is not a single entity, it's a syndrome, and same is for dystonia or tremor. And we are now using, for instance, genetics, trying to understand which patient is better candidate uh, versus the others. So we're trying to get better with biomarkers. And the second part that needs improvement, is, this is probably the most important, is the post-operative care, not, not just right after for programming, but over the years. We, we are, for instance, one of the few centers in Canada doing DBS, and we are probably the ones with the largest volume. And we have so many patients that sometimes it's difficult for us to uh, be fast in replying emails or phone calls or seeing them on an urgent basis. And we have postdocs, fellows coming from every corner of the world to help us. And thankfully they come to learn from us, but without them, we'll be even in a much worse condition. But certainly we should do more to expedite the appointments after surgery. I'm sure that it's common experience, common frustration to all of our patients that they want to get a hold of us. And it takes, it takes days sometimes for them to, to speak with us. 
And from the surgery side of things, uh, Ben, um, we, we also teach uh, the operation um, in courses and fellows. Uh, and part of our surgery, uh, we do quality control for every single operation. So the goal is always to make the next operation better than the previous one. Um, and, um, and every lead that's positioned. And, and uh, it's not just a technical exercise, it's a team-based exercise. So, so if if we have someone that is not happy with with the surgery or the outcome um, or the family notices um, uh, differences, we, we review that case very closely to understand, are there other options? Is it is there a mismatch between expectations um, and, and what we delivered? Or is the electrode um, maybe suboptimally placed? Or should we add an additional electrode or adjust programming? So there is a lot of this cycl cyclical quality control. So uh, at a systems level, we're continuing to improve our, our surgeries. But at, with each individual patient, um, as, as our time allows, we, we also try and uh, see if we can um, improve uh, the outcome, if there are any reversible or addressable things that we can do uh, to improve the outcome. So I, I think there is this iterative process that occurs. You know, it's a hard question, Ben. I was just thinking about that. It's um, one of the things that strikes me is that I actually get to meet everybody before surgery, but there is just no way for me to meet everybody after surgery. But it would be helpful to have an understanding of situations in which perhaps we don't get the result that we want. And having a meeting such as that for us as a group um, so that we can understand and learn from, the, uh, from individuals who have more of a struggle than what we would expect and their partners or families as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so the next two questions are going to, uh, are asking about possible um, negative effects of the treatment. Uh, so first question, we talk about motor symptoms. What about the psychiatric and behavioral impacts? Can you get post-traumatic stress disorder from experiencing brain surgery and its recovery period? Uh, anybody else want to feel this one? Uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is, a, is a, what you are about to undergo, as Ben has shown you the pictures and what he describes is actually an acute stress response. This is stressful, it's difficult. We, uh, Dr. Kalia and the operative team go to extreme lengths to make it as comfortable and as um, stress-free as possible, but you're awake and it's there, you're there for a number of hours and it's difficult. Most people do not develop post-traumatic stress disorder after this, it's possible, but you have to realize that post-traumatic stress disorder is a combination of factors. It's a combination of actually what happens and a combination of the person that you are, your own history. So there is, there are other elements that are involved. Um, now, the other element that I think Ben alluded to is, and, and I've mentioned as well, is that Parkinson's is a complicated illness with a lot of different factors. What you have with surgery is another factor that comes into the treatment of your Parkinson's disease. There are still medication factors. There are still other elements, other illnesses that you may already have prior to the surgery, whether it's depression, whether it's bipolar disorder, there are other elements that are relevant. So with surgery, there is an added element that we as the treating team have to figure out. And there is risk with these medications that you take already for Parkinson's disease, never mind surgery that uh, you may have impulsivity or mania-like symptoms or sleep problems. And these continue. Uh, and these are the ones that we're trying to adjust for in a very careful way after surgery so, that to, so as to give you the best outcome. Okay, thank you. Um, and this one more about physical activities. So what activities can't I do after having uh, DBS, um, and there's a list of activities, flying, swimming, contact sports. 
This is, uh, I think, a question for the surgeon because I usually tell us, tell patients, do what Dr. Kalia or the other surgeon said. So please, Sumil. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I think once you heal completely from the surgery, and we give you uh, working guidelines. This is not an exact science, but I tell people once once every once you're completely healed, uh, and depending on the activity, it's a period of eight to twelve weeks. Certainly, the day after surgery, if everything goes well, you can walk around um, within a, within a week or two. Um, walking outside, um, uh, uh, we we tend to tell people to avoid lifting heavy things across the chest, so no push-ups, uh, just so the the computer that's implanted in the chest that heals nicely and doesn't move around. But after you heal, um, I say uh, no restrictions. You know, if you're going to parachute out of airplanes or do kickboxing or something like that, there, there's always uh, a, a, a small risk to, to fracturing or breaking the wire, breaking the device. So, so just so everybody understands, if that happens, we can fix it, but it means more surgery to fix. Um, so the whole goal, it's a difficult procedure and there's uh, really multiple marathons of the marathon of the assessments, uh, then the surgery marathon, um, and then of course the programming marathon. And once you've gone through those, um, the way I look at it is you deserve to, whatever your quality of life improves, whether it's squash, swimming, golf, tennis, any of these things. We do uh, say one caveat though, we say I, I'll, for all my patients, I tell them if at any time anybody, you come in for an adjustment for a medication or an adjustment mm -hmm. to your stimulation to practice for 15 or 20 minutes, whatever it is that you do in a, in a safe environment. So if it's swimming, you know, practice in the shallow end um, with any new adjustments for 15 or 20 minutes before jumping into deep water, um, squash or tennis, hit the ball against the wall. But really the goal is to, to do what you, what you like. So no real restrictions from my perspective. Once you fully heal, uh, I worry about the people that get back to things within the first six weeks while they're still healing. Um, because uh, the device, it's, it's annoying, the battery, the computer in the chest can start moving around on you. And the only way I can fix that again is, is we would have to do a bit more surgery to get that back in position. So, so um, that would be my answer to that question. Uh, if I can, I'd just like to add one quick thing to that though, or maybe a question as well back to Dr. Kalia. But I'm wondering because I have noticed in myself, and I've seen a lot of patients as well report that there's something kind of like weird disbalances that they experience between their left side and the right side of the body. Um, and I notice this while swimming or biking or doing a lot of different activities now, they're just harder to coordinate sometimes. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that and if it is as common as I think it is. I, I, that's a good question, actually, for Dr. Fasano. I can speak briefly. Um, uh, certainly, uh, with, with the device, when if you are having both sides of the brain done with the programming, um, uh, they're, they're, um, uh, the programs are different on both sides, and the disease is also asymmetrical. Uh, so changes with programming may be, may be more noticeable. I, 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 I bet you it, it, it is more common uh, than, than we notice, uh, Ben, just like, you, like um, you're describing. Um, and I think that's where it's important when you come back for your programming visit uh, to, um, uh, to try to relay that to the team. Um, our teams have a short time with you. Uh, at these programming visits. So, so come with that, um, you know, a, a, a diary or, or something that says my left side in swimming now isn't, isn't the same as the last setting, but I'll let Dr. Fasano um, continue the answer to that question. No, no, you, you said it all, Sunil, over time, you, you became a neurologist, basically, and uh, so that's the answer, I think. Uh, just a note on programming and fine-tuning programming, sometimes we ask patients to help us uh, with the programming, they might use a remote control uh, to, to adjust uh, you know, one side over the other, exactly, for situations like the one Ben uh, was describing. Uh, there is uh, another way to program patients, we, we just got approved in Canada, uh, which is available with certain devices, uh, which is uh, remote programming. So in the future, we'll be also able to program patients uh, while they're home and we are in our office using the internet. And obviously this is something very useful in a situation like uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, uh, and again, this is another example how the pandemic has accelerated uh, certain aspects of modern medicine in a good way.
Hey, thank you very much for that. So that uh, is uh, the submitted questions. We're now going to move to the live questions. So thank you to everyone who submitted questions so far. Uh, first question, if it makes sense, can you cover DBS considerations for people with akinetic rigid or PIGD subtype of Parkinson's? Since this progresses faster, should they consider DBS sooner? And do they fare as well as tremor dominant? Uh, yes. Please provide whatever yeah. you think is appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this one. I, I guess we, we don't have many minutes, so I'll try to be fast um, uh, because I would like to address them all. Uh, so obviously tremor dominant Parkinson's is the one that performs the best. Uh, the other ones don't do so well. They still improve, uh, but there is a risk of making balance worse, for instance, in some patients or freezing worse in some patients. And this is when we want to do surgery a little earlier, maybe that's a good point. Or we may want to go to a different target like the globus pallidus. Uh, so yes, it's doable, maybe a little earlier if we're afraid of uh, brain frailty, um, but not as good as tremor dominant Parkinson's. Uh, thank you very much for that. Next question. What is the possible side effects of the DBS approach? Maybe, maybe Sunil can briefly talk about the surgical risks, right? The, the, I, um, so there's, I think you can put them into two different categories, the, the risks and the side effects. So specifically with, with this as, as mentioned at the beginning, so we're clear this is a brain operation. Um, it is a, a statistically a very safe operation. And that in that operation, we have to deliver um, two electrodes or one electrode that are about one uh, millimeter in diameter to a target deep in the brain that's about uh, seven millimeters. So there's many steps uh, to the surgery, which we go into detail um, uh, as we uh, go through the process. Um, but if something goes wrong, uh, like a catastrophic event, uh, bleeding or stroke uh, can uh, cause death. Um, that's extremely rare. Um, that's less than 1%, closer to 0.1%. So if you can get over that, that very small risk of a catastrophic event, we, we uh, tend to focus our discussions on the side effects or complications that are in the one to 10% zone. Um, that includes having a commitment. So with the surgery, you're committing to having an implanted device. So we, we discuss battery changes, uh, which is a day surgery operation. It's a smaller surgery. Uh, you're in in the morning and out by lunchtime, but it is still a surgery. You have to come to the hospital. Uh, maintenance of the wires, like we talked, if there's any damage Damage or fracture to the wires or infection, we might have to remove parts of the device or put it put uh, put um, new uh, wires in. Of course, if the brain wires are affected, that means repeating the brain surgery. Over 10 years, the risk of infection is, um, I would say, less than 7%, uh, probably lower than that if you review uh, our cases and, and, and more recent literature. The operation is safer in this decade than it was in the previous decade, and it continues to get uh, safer. Um, the other uh, uh, side effects, if you will, are on-target and off-target side effects uh, from the stimulation, and they can be uh, a range of symptoms that are generally reversible as the stimulation is turned down. We, I don't think we need to get into the specifics of that here. It depends on the target. We can review that with the team. Um, and then the other possibility is despite all the safety measures we put in, the specialized equipment and everything, uh, there's there's always a, a possibility of having a lead that's that's suboptimally placed. And despite uh, several months of, of programming, uh, we'll review the case and it may uh, require the addition of another lead or, or repositioning of the electrode, which of course then requires further surgery. So I think that would be a very small nutshell. I think the the uh, booklets that you will, you will get uh, um, include uh, our Toronto Western um, booklets do include a lot of this information. Um, I'll see if Alfonso wants to add anything to, to that. Um, uh, no, no, it was uh, uh, very comprehensive and you're right. Uh, we have booklets that will be distributed uh, to people interested and I'll leave it to the organizers how to, but uh, yeah, we have three PDFs at least for the three different diseases. 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, just so people are aware, if you've submitted a question, Dr. Fasano has been answering some of them uh, directly. So please keep an eye on your question. Um, you might get a direct answer to that one. So the next question, uh, what percentage of patients get better sleep after DBS surgery? I can take this one. It's a good sign uh, when sleep uh, improves and I would say uh, they should all get better. Uh, because sleep impairment in Parkinson's is mainly related to lack of mobility in the middle of the night. DBS works 24 hours a day. So it's like getting therapy minute by minute, even when you're asleep, and that helps your mobility in the middle of the night when you're asleep, reduces rigidity, painful cramps, that helps. In some cases, however, uh, sleep is not improved, and this is actually worsened by the medication reduction. And this is particularly the case for uh, patients with restless leg syndrome. Uh, but they, it's an easy fix when we realize that things are getting worse because we are lowering the medication too much. We use more medications, perhaps at bedtime only. Uh, but in general, sleep impairment is one good reason to go uh, for DBS. And I'll just add that oftentimes the, the improvement in sleep also leads people to feel a little bit fresher during the day, more alert, more attentive. And um, when they come to see us at that one-year post-operative assessment, um, they'll often say that they feel like they're clearer in their thinking, they're better able to concentrate because they are sleeping better. Um, so it doesn't necessarily, uh, DBS doesn't necessarily directly affect people's thinking abilities and improve them, but that improved sleep, sometimes the reduction in medication, all those things um, kind of have a, a nice effect on people's subjective feelings about their thinking skills, that they're clearer, they're better focused, um, and they're better able to kind of um, concentrate and perform thinking tasks that they, they like to do in their day-to-day -day life. Great, thank you for that. So the next question is for Ben. Uh, ben, you started talking about the wire harness in your neck. Can you please continue? Sorry, the wire harness? What's the wire harness? Oh, the thing that was like bolted into my skull, I'm guessing or the wires through my neck, I'm not sure which one. Right. Well, I can talk about both quickly if you want, but um, so yeah, that bolting, that, that giant frame that I had in my head, I had to wear it for about six or seven hours on the day of, because and one kind of little funny story that I can tell at the beginning is that um, I remember that there's an emergency case that came in as my surgery was supposed to be starting as well. So that meant that I, and my case was like, I think it was June 1st or June 2nd, which was very soon after we actually lifted some of the COVID restrictions. So the OR was pretty full of people. So every kind of patient that walked by, they would look around and they would see me because I, I was just waiting like very close to where the operating room was. So they'd see me almost as soon as they walked in that door and they'd, they'd have like this quick look of shock on their face, just seeing my, that, those two like frames, those things with those frames bolted in. However, the frame itself is very annoying as well. It was actually probably one of the worst parts of the whole procedure just because having that weight on your head for so long is difficult. Um, and having so much pressure like all around your skull is difficult. There's no real pain associated because your, your scalp is basically frozen. So you don't feel it very much. I didn't really feel any pain other than the stabbing of the needles. Um, and I, I guess Dr. Kelly had a lot to do with that. He seemed very kind and very per personable the whole way through. Although there wasn't one point where he told me to be quiet for a little bit because I had to like do some of the micro electro recording. Um, but if you're talking about the wiring through the neck, uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what could be done at this point to improve that process. Other than hopefully, I hope one day there might be a wireless battery. Um, maybe that would be a good question to ask actually of, the whole, of Dr. Cali and Dr. Fasano. At what point might these things improve to the point where it might actually be worth it for you to tell a patient if you wait six months, you'll actually have a much better chance of getting something much better very soon. Um, I don't know if that's off topic or not, but I don't know if you want, who wants to address it first? Well, that's a big question uh, and uh, it taps into the uh, technology and how it advances. And sometimes we know what's about to come, and, but it's hard to predict. Uh, in the past, I've said it, uh, and some patients have said, wait a little longer because something else is coming. So we, we keep a radar, on our radar what's happening. Um, so to answer your question in short, we keep that in mind when we talk to patients. And, and the devices are, are generally backwards compatible. So as new iterations, new features come out, usually it works with the previous generations. Um, we're still a ways away from having cranial mounts, like head mounted 
uh, rechargeable system. So it, it would it would be something um, that we go back to what's the right time for you and everybody's different. Um, uh, you know, uh, um, in terms of the benefit versus the next iteration in the technology, but the iterations come very quite slowly, actually. Um, uh, so um, we, we could we'd answer those questions, as, as Dr. Fasano said, if, if we thought there was technology and part of our job as a team, there's many options, there's many different devices, and we match the technology to uh, what, what the needs are of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, a given patient and their symptoms. Um, so, so that's also something we consider. Yeah, I just wanted, I saw in the chat, there's a very good point that was just raised about the wiring itself and that I don't feel it anymore at all right now. So after I think about three or four months, the whole the feeling of it completely went away from me. Those first four months, it kind of sucked, but afterwards, hopefully I'll have a long, long time where I'll be able to benefit from having this thing in my neck. So all in all, it's definitely worthwhile, despite all the things I've had to go through since. Great, thank you. Um, so at this point, this is our last question. So if anyone wanted to submit uh, more questions, the floor is open. This question is also for Ben. Uh, what would, oh, sorry, we just got another question. Okay. Uh, so Ben, what would you have researched uh, that you did not? What should you have paid more attention to in your opinion? Um, I think it's just what I said before. I focused too much on the day of the surgery itself. I didn't really understand anything that came afterwards. I thought the surgery was going to be the worst of the whole thing, the whole ordeal. And, and I guess in many ways, it, like, it's definitely the most traumatic day that you'll go through. And if anybody wants to know, but the most traumatic part of the surgery itself is actually the drilling of the two bore holes. But if anybody wants more detail, I can talk about that later as well. But um, yeah, I'd focus a lot more on the programming, I guess. The programming is definitely the most complicated part of this whole procedure. And prior to, I didn't give it much, pay much attention because I thought that surgery itself was gonna be the most traumatic thing, but it's actually the programming that's far, far, far more important. Well, they're both like equally important, but once again, you don't have much control over where the leads are. We have a lot of control over the programming and you have to be very careful about what you even say to your, to this guy, <laughs> to your neurologist. Uh, not careful, but in the sense like, you have to be able to clearly communicate exactly what you're feeling, not only on the day that you arrive, but almost like week to week and month to month afterwards as well. You have to have some way of actually being able to communicate with whoever your programmer is, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you, more importantly, what needs to be changed. Because they need to be able to quickly tell you, or you need to be able to quickly convey to them when you go and see them, whether or not you need to change your stimulation and how much and to what degree. Because if they can't do that properly, then they can't even do their job properly either. So it's your job to communicate to them how you're feeling at, during that time of that, since the last programming session. Um, and I don't know if Dr. Zano, maybe you can add a little bit onto that. I, one other question I would have for everybody also, I think we haven't spent enough time talking about some of the things that could go wrong as well. Um, I know I have a lot of friends all around the world right now who are going through DBS and some of them are go frankly going through hell because of this procedure. Um, now, I think if they had had it here in Toronto, frankly, some of them would not have been going through it, but others would probably still be going through some of the same difficulties that they went through. So I'm wondering if you could just explain, I think it's very important to explain a little bit more about some of the bad things that can happen because of DBS. Uh, I'll be right back though, I have to quickly run. I'll be right well, back. The worst thing that can happen uh, from DBS, excluding the surgical um, um, adverse events, like a bleeding, um, because in theory, the worst things that can happen is, uh, that the patient dies. This is extremely rare, but it's not impossible. As we know, anytime someone is in the OR. Um, but I guess that th there are two different scenarios. One scenario is when patient gets the surgery and there's no improvement or there's not, the, the improvement that was expected to be seen is not seen. And unfortunately this happens, happens even when we think the patient would be perfect. Uh, there is a certain variability. We, uh, like any human activity, uh, there are limitations and we are not perfect, even though over the years we kind of realized which ones are the factors to keep track of. But the other thing I want to say is that in some cases, DBS itself can make things worse. And this is particularly the case of wrong diagnoses. I have seen that there are a number of questions about PSP or if you want even multiple system atrophy, these are the so-called atypical Parkinsonism or Parkinson's plus syndrome. And often they're mistaken for Parkinson's at, at the beginning. 
And the reason why we don't do the operation in these patients is not simply because we know that it doesn't work, but because we can make things worse. In other words, if the brain is too frail, and in these conditions it gets certainly more so than you will expect in Parkinson's, having a brain operation on top it doesn't make the brain happier. Uh, and after surgery, there, there are worsening, uh, there's worsening of uh, balance, speech, cognition in some cases. The same can apply to people with cognitive disorders and surgery can make the con con cognitive part even worse because once again, it's a brain operation uh, done to a or an organ, the brain that is already suffering. So there is a trade-off between what we can get and the risk. And the paradox is that more the, the, the disease, the more an advanced therapy is needed. Uh, so the job of the assessment is really to figure out when it's time to do surgery and when it's safe to do. Uh, there are different targets. If we are concerned, concerns about uh, there are concerns about um, um, safety, um, or there are procedures that, that are not DBS based. DBS is not the only advanced option on the table, and this is something that we always make uh, make clear when we speak to patients. And this goes back to your presentation, Ben, when you had the the different um, poker card uh, poker cards. Uh, it's just one of the options. Uh, if it's not good for you, there are a few things that, uh, that can be tried, uh, certainly less invasive, or less dangerous. Uh, but if you can get DBS, I think you should go for DBS because not every person is a good fit uh, for DBS. That's why for us is the priority. Alexa, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so I am getting some more questions, um, both in the Q&A, but also from the team on a separate uh, device. So we have about five questions now. So the next, so I'll toggle between the two. Um, so the next question, what should people expect to encounter in the cognitive screening prior to DBS or anything, um, or is there anything they should know? Marta, it looks like you are up for this question. Yes, that's my domain. Um, so the first thing I want to make clear is that it's not a cognitive screening. It is a very thorough neuropsychological assessment. Um, so some other centers um, do a very brief screening, something called like a, a, a MOCA that you might have seen, something that Donald Trump passed and was very proud of. Uh, and so some centers rely on that very heavily. And certainly our neurologists do administer that measure as well to kind of early on get a sense of somebody's a good candidate or not. Um, and that might be one of those yellow lights that Dr. Kalia brought up before. Um, but then if somebody is considered a good uh, candidate, they would be sent to our clinic to do a, a very thorough assessment of their thinking abilities. Um, and that includes talking to myself or my colleague, Dr. Melanie Cohn, who's also a neuropsychologist, and so we can learn more about you and then undergoing probably about four to five hours of testing to look at your attention, memory, problem solving abilities. It's very, very thorough. Um, and if somebody needs an interpreter because English is not their first language, we also uh, provide that because we want people to be able to perform at their very best during this assessment. Um, and at the end, we've provide people with feedback and answer any questions that they might have. Um, so it is quite a, a lengthy day. Um, and most people find it challenging um, and fun in some ways. Some of the tasks are a little bit like board games and they really enjoy it. Other tasks are quite uh, challenging and people get frustrated. Um, but I wanna just make clear that it is a thorough assessment and it's a long day. So that's the one thing that you should be prepared for that it's gonna be um, long and thorough. <laughs> And the, the analogy I use there is for all these tests, everybody's um, nervous about many of the tests. And, and I try and say it's the idea here is where it's safety. So we're establishing safety and we're, we're seeing, um, uh, you know, is there enough, uh, the analogy I use is enough gas in the gas tank to, to safely get you through the surgery. Going back to Ben's earlier question, the last thing we want to see after this operation is a patient telling us their quality of life is now worse. Uh, so, so our job is to de-risk all elements of the surgery and we each team member has a different role in, in de-risking this as low as possible. And then we, we factor in 
what we find on these uh, screens uh, in terms of targeting and device um, and uh, and whether DBS is is right for you at all. So so I, I think it's um, uh, every piece is is equally important and and you should the I, I always say that the tests are hard on purpose. <laughs> so, so because we really want to be sure that 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 we we can understand what the what the risks are so so do your best and they're some of them are meant to be uh, uh, challenging. Okay, thank you. So one of the questions I received uh, from the team that's reviewing them, um, this one's for, probably for Dr. Kalia. What are some of the scariest types of post surgical problems people get as they age? Do people get infections? What happens when the battery dies? So, so I'm going to interpret that as as you you've had your surgery was successful and your programming was successful and you're talking about longer term side effects or or issues related to the device. So as we discussed before, it is a lifelong commitment to having the device uh, in place. So if there's wear or tear related to the device, it it may not function as well. And so we have to troubleshoot it and and decide whether more surgery is required to to fix the device. There is a theoretical risk because it's a foreign device that if you get an infection somewhere else in your body that the bugs can through your bloodstream can seed the device and and then we have to uh, deal with that where we, we know how to manage uh, all of these things. The risk for something like that is quite low, 7% seven, 7 over 10 years. Um, with the battery uh, uh, dying, now the team teaches you how to monitor the battery and the health of the battery. Um, in, in rare cases, it can be a true emergency um, uh, for stimulation. And, and, we, and if, if, if someone's battery goes out and you're sweating, you're having chest pain, those types of things, it's very important to uh, attend the emergency department. And we do uh, so many cases that uh, every year, a few times uh, a year, I, I find myself having to change someone's battery in the middle of the night or late at night just because they're so unwell uh, off the therapy. It's helping them so much. Um, uh, but if, if the battery suddenly goes out, um, they can be in, in trouble requiring an urgent battery replacement. We like to avoid that if, if possible. And so uh, we, uh, as, as part of the visits with, with Dr. Fasano and his team, you can monitor the the um, uh, the 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 health of the battery, if you will, and um, and then we'd like to schedule the battery replacement as scheduled surgery. It's day surgery, in in the morning, out by lunchtime, generally. Um, uh, so th those are the things that come with with the commitment, the hardware side of things uh, with with the device. Um, another question I have, what about cervical dystonia? Is DBS appropriate for cervical dystonia and does it have any effect? Yeah, this is an easy question. It, it works for cervical dystonia. Um, it works for generalized dystonia and this is how we started doing DBS uh, in dystonia. And then over time, we noticed that even focal dystonia or segmental dystonia, which are not uh, involving the entire body, can respond uh, amongst those for, for sure cervical dystonia response. Um, obviously, we do DBS only when botulinum toxin therapy is no longer effective or it's, too, um, it's associated with side effects, uh, which can happen with botulinum toxin. You. Um, the next question is actually for uh, Darlene. Um, what are the resources for care partners? Darlene, what effect um, did this have on you? I, I think they mean were the resources um, available, were they helpful? Um, the program has progressed, obviously, since the 17 years since my husband had the uh, surgery. Um, the resources are the team that you see in front of you. Um, they're our second family. If we need something, we reach out. Yes, sometimes it may take a, a day or two to get a hold of someone, but they are there for you. As far as caregiver, um, the Parkinson's caregiver group. Uh, support uh, I have found very helpful. Uh, they do have a couple different types available depending on where you are within the program, uh, within your journey. Um, and I would recommend reaching out to them. But 
your first resource, your family, your second is the team that is hosting this. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, okay, next question. On the cognitive neuropsychological assessment piece, if a patient fails, maybe because of a bad uh, or off day, um, test or they're having test anxiety, um, is it possible to retry at another time or is the initial assessment a final result? I think Marta, that's for you. Yes, I was literally just typing that in response. So it's easier to say it in words. Um, we absolutely take those things into consideration. Sometimes people are very anxious about the, the testing. Um, sometimes their medications don't kick in that day or you know other things are happening. They haven't slept well, whatever the case may be. So we certainly take that into consideration when we're kind of thinking about the case and talking about it to our colleagues, like uh, the neurologists and the neurosurgeons and what have you. If we really think that the, the assessment wasn't valid and the, the results aren't true, uh, for that person. Um, we have brought people in to do a few more tests on a separate day. Sometimes we do the whole assessment at a different point. Um, so I think we're very fair. We would never say like red light, this person didn't sleep, but they did poorly on cognition on the cognitive testing and we're kicking them out of the program. Uh, I think we're, we're much more uh, attuned to people and we like to talk to people and hear their perspective on what's going on in that day. Um, so we certainly take those things into consideration. And absolutely, if, if we really think that the assessment wasn't valid or isn't true for that person, we, we could bring them back on a separate day and repeat testing. Uh, one thing, if I may add, Marta, uh, maybe you can comment on is that it's not just the test itself. It's also the history that you take, right? You're really interested in how people are doing at home and so on. I don't know if you want to mention that one. Yeah, absolutely. We talk to we we spend a lot of time with people. Um, like I said, the assessment is six hours, and it's not necessarily that you're six hours with me. A part of it, you're working with our assistants who do the, the test administration. So we get to know people pretty well, and we get to know about how things are going at home. And like I said, those different factors that might be coming up for somebody interfering with their ability to perform at their best. I mentioned earlier an interpreter. If somebody comes to the assessment and they thought, oh, I could do this in English. I've been living in Canada for 10 years. And then they come and they're like, ooh, this is too difficult to do in, a, in English. We can have that person come back with an interpreter so that, again, that they can perform at their best. Um, so we do really kind of take those things into consideration. And a neuropsychological assessment, like I mentioned earlier, what we do is not just test scores. It's kind of taking all those things into consideration. So we need to know what kind of education you completed, what kind of work you did in your life, um, because that'll help us have expectations. If somebody comes to me and says, um, you know, I was a neurosurgeon at Toronto Western Hospital for 25 years, and now I, I'm having a cognitive assessment, I might have different expectations about how they would perform, as opposed to somebody who came and said, you know, I didn't graduate from high school, and I really struggled in school, I haven't really been able to hold down a job for my life. Um, so I'm going to have different expectations for how that person should perform on testing. And that's why it's so important to, to know more than just the test scores so that we can kind of interpret them appropriately. Great, thank you. So I think this will be our last question. Um, so from up here, um, I'm a psychologist and I work with, with DBS uh, for four years. In my experience, the patient who has not psychologically processed the news of, their, uh, of the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease often needs support after the DBS uh, treatment. Many patients experience a moment of disappointment. Um, from having had DBS in the five or six months after the operation. Uh, this disappointment occurs even if it was well selected. I noticed that patients in the pre-surgery need to be very investigated on aspects of, um, I think, expectations of healing. Uh, do you find you have the same experience? You know, this You're muted, Messius. <laughs> this is a tough question in, in some ways. It's, um, um, you know, in some of the research that we've done with Parkinson, people with Parkinson's disease, uh, about a quarter of individuals with Parkinson's disease don't actually think they have the illness. And there is nothing like having holes drilled in your head for your Parkinson's disease that brings home the fact that you do actually, in fact, have Parkinson's disease. So it's uh, the reality hits and the reality also hits that 
for many people, this is the final treatment that they can hope for at this time. So this is the best in many ways that technology has to offer at the present time. And it's good, it's actually very good, but you still have the illness. There are still other elements here that are ongoing. We do not, we cannot at the moment manage all of them through this intervention. So yeah, at a certain point, once the programming is done, and it's usually around that six month, five month mark, there is that coming down to the ground and realizing, yeah, okay, things are better, but you know what? I, you know, I still would like to uh, be able to golf the way I was golfing, you know, a few years ago when my movement was better. Or there are other elements that, you know, are not improved. So, yeah, the feet hit the ground, and uh, the realization is that things are better, but they're not perfect. Okay, thank you very much, uh, everyone. That was our, our last question. So thank you to all of our panelists um, for taking the time to answer them. Um, and for all the attendees, of course, for attending the first um, Stimulating Conversations event. Just a reminder that there is a second event that will be hosted on December 8th um, at the same time. And as I mentioned earlier, um, all everyone who registered for the event will receive um, an email with the recording of this event and um, you'll be able to review the questions and answers uh, that were asked both through the recording and um, through the chat, I believe. Um, so I'm just gonna turn it over to Gord, our event chair for just some closing remarks. <laughs> yes. Uh... Well, my, my head's still spinning with all the information. I gotta, I gotta sleep on this. But thank you so much to the uh, clinical team and uh, to, to the PAB for doing all the ground, groundwork and getting, getting this thing off the road. Really looking forward to the uh, next, uh, next session in December. Um, I guess that's it. We're done for today. Thank you for joining us.